Hello, welcome to the Science for Policy podcast. My name's Toby, and today I'm joined by Professor and Judge Helen Keller. Professor Keller holds the Chair for Public Law, European and Public International Law at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. She has served as a judge at the European Court of Human Rights, which has jurisdiction across nearly every country in Europe, and she's currently an international judge in the Constitutional Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina. She's also been a member of the United Nations Human Rights Committee, and among many awards and honours, she was awarded the 2021 Madame de Staël Prize by the Academy Association ALEA for her contributions to human rights law in Europe. So, Helen, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Toby. Hello. So, as you know, our main focus here on the podcast is conversations about how the domains of science and policy interact. So what happens when scientists advise policymakers and all the complexities that entails. So one reason I'm looking forward to talking to you is because you represent a different domain, the domain of the judiciary, where uh, I guess science could also have an advisory role. And I wonder if we can kind of compare notes, as it were, about any interesting analogies or disanalogies between your domain and mine. So that was my initial idea. But then I think there's also a separate question I hope we can get to about ways that the courts and litigation can also be used as a different way to try to influence policymakers directly. So not as an analogy, but as a literal kind of second route or second prong of attack for people who haven't had much success with the normal like direct routes of voting and campaigning and so on. Um, and this is something I think we've touched on not one bit in more than 40 episodes of this podcast, which is embarrassing. So I hope you can set that straight. <laughs> Having said that, before we do either of those things, um, please don't assume that I or many of our audience of mostly scientists and policymakers know a huge amount about the European Court of Human Rights, where you're a judge, um, or about courts in general. So perhaps by way of introduction to the topic, can I invite you to give us a quick rundown of the Strasbourg Court and how it works? Um, To understand the primary task of the European Court of Human Rights, I have to mention two things. The first is the historical context, the court as a reaction of the breakdown of human rights in the Second World War. And the second is the subsidiary role of the court vis-à-vis the member states of the Council of Europe. I start with the first. We have to understand that until the Second World War, international human rights was at its infancy. Any time when there was a human rights violation, the states could defend themselves and say, oh, this is our internal affairs. And so nobody from the international community could intervene. This changed completely after the Second World War. People understood that the sovereignty of the state has to be reduced in order to have an institution on the international level that would guarantee a minimal level of human rights. So after the Second World War, Quite a lot of international human rights standards were established, among others the European Convention on Human Rights in 1950. But this is not the only achievement. The convention goes together with a court. So the basic idea was not only to have human rights on paper, but an institution that will guarantee those rights. And this brings me to my second point, the subsidiarity. The idea was that a human being has first to go through all the courts on the national level and only then this person would be allowed to go to the Strasbourg court. So this subsidiary role is quite important in order to understand the functioning of the European Court of Human Rights. So if I can summarize this in a more general way, I would say international courts and tribunals are very typical for the development in international law in the second half of the last century. 
Each of this institution has its own task. So the International Criminal Court deals with crimes, big crimes. The International Court of Justice has to settle disputes between states. And the European Court of Human Rights is here as an institution to guarantee those rights from the Convention. Hmm. I don't want to sound too cynical, but this process where countries more or less permanently handed over part of their sovereignty to an external court, that seems like something very much of its time. I wonder if you can imagine it happening now. It was a very special moment, a very unique time where the international community could agree on that. I have doubts that this would happen uh, in in the times that we have now, the political agreement for such a huge step to reduce the sovereignty of national states, I don't think that we have an agreement uh, about that uh, nowadays. Yeah, although it has survived. I guess it's a bit harder to dismantle something that already exists than it is just to avoid building it in the first yes. place. Yes. But of course, the, the court struggles with a lot of resistance from certain member states and not only from member states with a bad human rights record. Others also um, yeah, resist certain jurisprudential developments from Strasbourg. Mm. Well, mm. <laughs> as a Brit who used to work in European politics, believe me, I'm familiar with that rather contentious dynamic. But a question, though, for clarification. Um, I mean, there are many different kinds of courts in the world, and many of them have power over individuals, right? That's perhaps the classic image that comes to mind when I imagine a court. It's a place where uh, if I'm accused of a crime, I can defend myself, and eventually it will determine what happens to me. But something like the Strasbourg Court works a bit differently, doesn't it? What's its area of jurisdiction? Jurisdiction is a, a, a difficult term and a difficult word. So jurisdiction, let's say it this way, each state that has ratified the European Convention on Human Rights has an obligation to guarantee those rights. And the jurisdiction very much links this obligation. So each person under the jurisdiction of, let's say, the UK, Switzerland, Italy or Latvia, not necessarily a national, but a person that is present in the territory of this state, can address a human rights violation before the national courts and then go to Strasbourg. So it's jurisdiction over a state and over... The subject matter is defined by human rights standards. Got it. Yeah. What I think is interesting for our purposes going forward is that the, the Court of Human Rights can influence public policy, right? It's not its job to lock up citizens or, or hand out fines or whatever. It's really directed towards governments. Its judgments are intended to change or, or redirect public policy within these defined subject areas, like you said. Yes. And because human rights is a very broad notion, uh, very many policy areas are concerned. For example, big data, um, combating terrorism, um, vaccination, all that has a clear link to human rights protection. Okay, so far so good. So now the final piece of the puzzle about the relevance of this conversation is to add in the factor of science. Because here I think it's also kind of familiar to all of us because we've all watched, I don't know, courtroom dramas on TV or, or read detective novels or whatever. We know clearly science and expert opinions of scientists can play a role in, for instance, criminal trials. Was it the victim's blood on the knife? Uh, what are the chances that this DNA match was a coincidence? Whatever. To what extent do scientific questions also need to be addressed in cases like those which have come before you as a judge in Strasbourg? Do you have any good examples in mind? Uh, I'll give you some examples, but let me make the link between subsidiary role and evidence and science. Hmm, go ahead. Uh, normally, in the ideal world, 
an individual would go through the first instance court, the second and the third one. And the national courts would define the subject matter of the case, or in more technical terms, the scope of the case, l'objet de litige, and they would also define the facts, what happened on the ground. So, in the ideal case, this would come as a small package and arrive in Strasbourg and the court would say, oh, this is the legal question. This happened and now we ask whether this and this human rights has been violated. Now, in many cases, this is not possible because the facts are disputed and because in certain cases, certain countries are not willing to establish the facts. And I'll give you here an example that you can understand. Secret renditions was a practice in Europe. This was done under the ages of the CIA after 9-11. So people were arrested secretly in Europe. They were tortured in secret prisons. They were transported in foreign countries, tortured there. And all was very, very secret. And in 2011, a first case reached the court, El Masri versus Macedonia. Not versus United States of America, because the USA are obviously not a country that has ratified the European Convention of Human Rights. So the applicant, Khaleh al Mazri, had a very similar name as one of the major persons involved in 9 11. So the CIA was very, very interested in Khaleh al Mazri because they thought he was the mastermind of 9 11. Khaled al Masri traveled to Skopje, and the CIA advised the Macedonian police to catch him, to put him in a, a secret prison, and to interrogate him. After a few days, the Macedonian said, well, we don't find anything. It's, it's really difficult. So the advice from the CIA, do interrogate a little bit more intense. Yeah, they couldn't find anything. And then the CIA decided to take Khaled El Masri over and to bring him to Kabul, to the well-known prison Abu Ghraib. There, El Masri was tortured over four months. The CIA could not find anything out because... He was not the mastermind. He had a similar name, but he had nothing to do with 9-11. They brought him back to Europe and said, well, shut up and forget what happened the last four months. Khaled El Masri is um, a, a German national. He tried to go through the German courts. He tried to go through the Macedonian courts, but... No, silence everywhere. And then he brought the case together with an NGO before the Strasbourg court. And now you understand the facts of the case were completely disputed. The government said, well, he traveled to Macedonia and then he left the country. He was a normal tourist. We don't know what happened. Now, it was a very difficult case because the secret rendition at the time was a big secret in all over Europe. Khaled El Masri had done several things that helped him. For example, he tried to remember the prison in Kabul and he was able to draw a sketch from the prison and this was very similar to the really existing prison then when he came back to germany he got a haircut and he kept the hair and the medical analysis of the hair 
uh, showed that he was for several months in Asia and that he had received too little food. And this coincided with the fact that he went twice on a hunger strike. He tried to protest against the torture and did not accept any food and then he was forced to eat. But he gave us little pieces and at the end of the day the court accepted those evidence and believed him. And it is an extremely important case and it made it uh, on the front page of the New York Times the day after. And of course it is formally a case against Macedonia, but behind was the United States and the very illegal method of torture and secret renditions. Yeah, understood. So this is an example where the Strasbourg court doesn't receive this neat package with the scientific facts are already resolved by lower courts, where it has to do its own discovery, in effect, to establish the facts for itself. Yes, yes. How does it work? Judges, I guess, have to ask scientists for information and read and understand and interpret it. Yes, the court does that from time to time. And this reminds me another case where the court had to start from the scratch. It was not an individual application, but an interstate case. One country comes and brings another country before the court and says, well, the other country has violated human rights. Those proceedings are in numbers. They're not so often, but they're very costly for the court. And I was involved in one of those uh, interstate proceedings. It was Georgia versus Russia. And... Um, it concerns the war between Georgia and Russia in 2008. You might remember in August there was a five-day war between those two countries. And the context was there are two regions in Georgia, South Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Those two territories were supported by Russia in their secession movement. And at a certain point, Georgia wanted to get back those two regions. And they started with military force to get power in those, in those two regions. Georgia did probably not count... <laughs> on a very strong answers by the Russians, but the Russians started an international armed conflict with the reasoning, we, the Russians, have to defend our local people in those two separate regions. And then the Georgians brought this situation before the court and said, well, the Russians reacted in a completely disproportionate manner. And the human rights of the Georgian nationals in those two regions were violated. Now, this was in terms of what happened really during the war and after the war on the grounds a very difficult case because we have to understand those two territories are closed. From a Western country, you cannot travel there. So establish the facts on the grounds in a territory where there was a war and you cannot travel there. This is really difficult. And this brings me back to your question. We, we had a two weeks witness hearing. Witness from both sides were heard, but this was also difficult because they had to travel to Strasbourg. We had to give them uh, translation, you know, Georgian, Russian, Georgian, um, English. It's very, very complicated. 
and also to secure those people while they were in um, Strasbourg. I mean, some of the witnesses, they said very brutal things about the other side. So, yeah. Yeah. And the court heard also experts from both sides, in particular uh, military personnel. And the court called its own experts. And this was one of the most interesting experiences for me personally. I remember a young woman, and at the time she worked for an NGO that collects randomly satellite images from the whole world. You might now say satellite images randomly every day, whatever you can get, you collect it. <laughs> <laughs> but this is big data, and the data was extremely important for us because this young woman, this expert, she explained to us that a bombed village looks completely different than a village that was burned. So she showed us pictures from the region and she could exactly say at what time the village was bombed and when the village was burned. And on the basis of those satellite images and her analysis, certain claims of the parties, they fall down like a, a house of cards. And I've never, you know, imagined before that satellite images would play such a vital role in a proceeding. Mm -hmm. So these are cases where the results turn on the science, where the evidence is instrumental in understanding what happened and coming to conclusions and eventually, I guess, coming to a verdict. So thinking again about analogies with the science for policy world, are there also cases where courts will go against the science or, or just ignore it or not follow it or hold it to be irrelevant? Yeah, let me go one step back. We have to understand that the court does not examine each and every case with the same scrutiny. So there might be cases like El Masri, where we have torture, where the court would examine a case very thoroughly and take, you know, any evidence that uh, would clarify the situation. In particular, in situation where we have the right to privacy or the right to personal life, then the court is much more reluctant and would... Um, leave a certain margin of appreciation to the national authorities. And I'll give you maybe an example here, which is, I think, quite interesting. It is um, Vavrichka versus the Czech Republic, and it concerns a mandatory vaccination against certain child disease. Okay, I see. Now, the, this mandatory vaccination, you know, nobody will come in the Czech Republic and force a child to be vaccinated. But if parents have no good reason why they don't want their child to be vaccinated, they get first a fine and then this child will not be allowed to school. So, the consequences are rather harsh for the child. Now, the court took into consideration different um, medical regulations in different uh, countries in Europe. And you can imagine that this is regulated quite differently in all over Europe. And then the court said, well, apparently there is no European consensus about this question and therefore the Czech Republic has a wide margin of appreciation and the court clarified that ultimately the issue to be determined was not 
whether a different, less prescriptive policy might have been adopted, as had been in some other European states, but rather it was whether in striking the particular balance that they did, the Czech authorities had exceeded their wide margin of appreciation in this area. And we do not interfere unless the whole thing is disproportionate or arbitrary. So the idea is that the court won't adjudicate on the science because it doesn't have to, because the range of possible actions is broad enough that the science doesn't make a difference. Yes. Okay. So let's think about areas where the science does make a difference. In in the world of science for policy, there's a whole big complex thing. I mean, it's complex in any area, right, where experts have to support decisions that are taken by non-experts. There are always practical difficulties and potentially ethical difficulties, even conceptual ones, about understanding how the whole thing should be framed. And here that's what courts are doing. So I want to ask, um, how well equipped are courts to understand and process and adjudicate the science in issues where science is a big element? I would make a difference. Uh, there are certain areas where scientific evidence is the daily business. Take the example of a murder and you have to examine whether this person was mentally ill at the material time. Those questions, I think they're very familiar The the judges have to be aware that they have to read those expertise. The expertise is not binding because at the end of the day, the court is responsible for the decision. But if they do not follow the expert opinion, at least there is a moral duty to justify that decision. It becomes more complex when we come to climate change litigations where you have a mass of information and maybe also conflicting information and information that is based on several different scenarios and we don't know which scenario will happen in the future. And here I think it is... Well, whether the courts are well equipped, maybe this is not the best way to put the question. I think science has to make all efforts to bring the courts into a position to understand their scientific evidence, to put the science in a language that an ordinary judge will understand, and also to be able as a scientist to show up in courts if the court asks them to come and to explain. I think this would be what I would formulate as a wish vis-a-vis the scientific community. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, that's a direct analogy with science for policy. The expert has this kind of duty to help things go smoothly by presenting their evidence in a way that makes it possible for the the politician or the judge not just to understand, but to see how it helps the decision that they face. This reminds me something uh, about the case that I mentioned before, Georgia versus Russia, and this amazing woman that showed us the satellite um, images. The Russian side, of course, understood how dangerous those satellites were. And they tried to discredit the expert by saying, oh, she's now working for an agency that is very close to the United States. We should not believe her for that reason. So you see, those are kinds of games in uh, cross-examining experts and witnesses happened in the real world as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so now, of course, something like this comes up in the policy arena. I mean, not usually trying to discredit a scientist. I guess that can also happen sometimes. But there's this whole problem of scientific disagreement, which is all very well. I mean, we can understand in the abstract why two different scientists might come to different conclusions on the same question based on the same evidence even. But it's a practical problem for policymakers who have to decide what to do it's a challenge for science communicators. It's a challenge even in, in the practice of science itself. 
Now, now I'm imagining how much more of a challenge it must be in a context where everything is contested, where the whole job of one group of people is to try and cast doubt on and undermine what the other group says. So how do courts manage that situation? Are there any strategies that judges use to figure out what to do and who to believe? Normally, it is the task of the parties to question the credibility of a scientific report handed in from the other side. So this is not normally not done by the court on its own motion, but rather the other party would say, oh, we do not agree with this and this point, and we have a counter expertise on this and this point. This is one um, possibility of dealing with that and then the court has to decide which is more convincing. Another thing is to say there is a general agreement to a certain point, and we assume that this is agreed, and apart from this point, there is a disagreement, but the disagreement is not crucial in order to answer our question. And this brings me to something that is particular uh, in the courtroom, and this is procedural law. It sounds very dry, but it helps quite a lot to manage a case, to make you know, a big package smaller and manageable. And it is important to abide to these procedural rules, because it's like in football. If you got the right to a penalty and then you have, you know, the decisive point and you won your match, then it is accepted because everybody know the rules of the game. And the rules in the courtroom are quite strict, but they help quite a lot. And to give you once again an example, I come back to the German climate case where the German Constitutional Court said, well, we accept that the large majority in the uh, scientific community agrees that there is a warming of the climate and that this warming will trigger a big um, change in the climate and at a certain point they will trigger, this this, uh, kick points, they will trigger processes that we cannot uh, reverse anymore. And by accepting this common sense on climate change, the court referred to the German parliament, the Bundestag, and said, this was the assumption that the political branch accepted and was the basis for the climate law that was in question. So the court did not make its own assessment, but referred to that that was done by the political branches. And then they elaborated, if this is the assumption, what the legislator should have done, So they took the assumption from the political branch and elaborated in a human uh, rights-friendly way what should be the measures or what is the area of possible measures. And then the court said, well, this is our ruling, but the concrete measures, to define the concrete measures, this has to be done once again by the parliament. Yeah, so the court can essentially say, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty detail of the science. But they basically say it's too late, right? You've already accepted this particular set of facts when you accept the scientific consensus. Yes. On the basis of that alone and the law, we can now say, here's the kind of response we require from you. So please figure out how to do it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so talking about the climate change case in Germany, then this takes us from talking about analogies between science and courts and science and policymaking to the second kind of case I wanted to discuss where the two come together. People are trying to influence policymaking through the courts by presenting 
scientific evidence to judges rather than politicians and hoping to get a better response. Why are we seeing this strategy with climate change, do you think? I think many persons feel really threatened by climate change and they are frustrated by the normal ways of dealing with such things. So they try to influence the parliament, they try to lobby for better climate laws, and they think that the states do not enough to stop the global warming. And therefore, they think that courts are good allies in the fight against climate change. Uh, It's certainly not money. Uh, I've done with two of my uh, younger colleagues a paper that just has been published. We analyzed about 300 cases uh, from the European Court of Human Rights in environmental matters. And we analyzed what was the claim and what was the outcome. You know, interim measures, general measures, just satisfaction, damage. And the result is, I would say, rather uh, a little bit sad. The court has done very, very little. In a famous case against Italy concerning a big industrial site in the coast near Taranto, where the national authorities, since 20 years, said, well, yeah, we know all the environmental standards, we breached them, But the activity is important. You know, the court said, well, Article 8, right to privacy and personal life is violated. But this is enough. We don't give you any money. And you have litigated that case over 20 years in Italy and then before the court. And yeah, you have a piece of paper that says your human rights have been violated over 25 years, but you do not get anything. So it's certainly not money, but the hope that the court will signal something that is taken more seriously on a national level than just, you know, a climate strike or public motion in parliament because there is no majority in the parliament to make climate laws more rigid. How do courts view this strategy in general? I think we cannot speak of a court in that sense. Probably it is very much a question of self-understanding. So in, in what tradition is a court and also probably a self-understanding of each individual judge. So there is a climate case coming from Switzerland, the Klima Seniorinnen, elderly women. And you have this uh, climate case from the German Constitutional Court. And if you read the two judgments, both in German, you think you are on a, on a, on a different continent. Because one court engaged very much, you know, in the whole discussion, in the scientific research. And the other court said, well, this is an issue that the political branches have to resolve. Full stop. And you can understand that the one court has a self-understanding. It is our task to defend the German Grundgesetz. And the other court said, well, this is not for us. And it's, I think you can explain the different understanding by a different historical experience. The German Constitutional Court was created after the Second World War, after this experience that democracy has failed, human rights have failed, And the ultimate goal of the German Constitutional Court is to guarantee the German Grundgesetz. And in Switzerland, the judges do not share such an experience. They say, well, let's see, let's take it easy. And the 
political branches will do what they have to do. Interesting, because there's this debate in the public sphere, uh, as you know, I'm sure, about what I gather is called judicial activism, where judges supposedly take it upon themselves not just to adjudicate legal disputes, or I suppose rather in, in the course of doing that, they also start to make public policy changes themselves. And the complaint being that they overstep their role and they're doing the work of the legislature. And I guess the climate change cases could be seen that way too, couldn't they? Yeah, certainly. Um, well, it depends on the national level, I think very much on the, the constitutional design in which a uh, uh, highest court is, but also on the tradition and uh, historic experience. So the German Constitutional Court, the Corte Constitutionale, they have a different understanding than, for example, the Swiss Federal Supreme Court. And I think it is fair to say that the European Court of Human Rights, because of its subsidiary role, would be rather reluctant to go into these cases. And I come back once again to the procedural rules. Those cases that are, the, those climate cases that are pending before the European Court of Human Rights, they face quite uh, big admissibility issues. There is a big case against 32 member states of the Council of Europe. It's the Portuguese case. Um, a bunch of young people from Portugal, they claim that several countries have done not enough uh, to combat climate change and they did not exhaust any remedy in any of these 32 countries and you probably understand this is you know you have to exhaust this is a very strict rule of the convention and you also probably understand if you have on the one hand a bunch of young people and on the other 32 member states the case is huge because for each step you will have 32 observations from the other side. So it, those cases are really huge, not only from the scientific point of view, from the submission, what is going on, but also what concerns the parties. Right, absolutely. But then, uh, then I have a technical question. If you find that, say, France is violating human rights by doing X, then I presume you tell France to stop doing X. But do all other countries that also do X have to change their ways too? I mean, maybe this is another reason why the judicial shortcut might look attractive to climate change campaigners. Because if you win, you can kill many birds with one stone. Formally, a judgment is valid inter partes, only for the two parties that are involved. But... The court has become a victim of its own success. So in many countries, people turn to the court because the human rights situation is really bad. So in 2011, the court had an amount from, of 160,000 pending applications from all over Europe. And this amount is now reduced to about 65,000, but it's still a lot. And the court had to find ways in order to deal with the cases, but also in order to signal a certain responsibility to the member states. And this brings me back to your question. The court said, well, if there is a leading case, for example, that each prisoner should have 3.5 meters square, otherwise if a person has to stay longer and has only 2 meters square in a prison, this would violate his or her uh, human rights, then this should be a standard that is binding for all member states so that not thousands of applications from Russia, from Ukraine, from Romania 
will end up before the court because the legal question is very simple. It's not enough space for the prisoners, so the human rights are violated. But uh, the domestic authorities should be able to remedy this problem on the national level. So technically, a judgment is binding only inter partes, but the court and the authorities on the European level would expect that other member states of the Council of Europe would implement such judgments in a, yeah, in a good way. Okay, that's logical. So climate change campaigners perhaps see litigation as a way to get extra ammunition for their wider political campaigns. I mean, where do you see the future of all this stuff going? It looks to me from the outside that this kind of litigation is quite fashionable at the moment. It's becoming very fashionable. And we also have to understand that quite a lot of NGOs started not only in the area of climate change, also in other areas, strategic litigation. So they pick out a good case, they bring together individuals and they say, look, we want to bring your case ultimately to Strasbourg. Would you go with us? Do you have enough time? And they will fund the the the, the proceedings because it's time consuming it, it costs to have a good lawyer and behind those climate litigation cases quite often there are powerful NGOs otherwise, otherwise the case would not make it to Strasbourg and my prognosis is that we will see more of them that they will be a big challenge for the court, in particular for the European Court of Human Rights, because they are on a tightrope road because the court has to show that it takes the human rights threat caused by climate change seriously. But on the other hand, the court has to show that it is not too activist. And this will not be easy in, the, in those climate cases. And one solution, in my view, is once again to take uh, procedural law very seriously. It will be a help for the court to make those huge case, cases manageable. Maybe some of the applicants will be frustrated in the first round, but with small success the more and more people will turn to the courts, not only on the European level, but also on the national level. Great. Thank you. And you've been extremely generous with your time. So um, although there's no doubt much more we could discuss, I will show my respect by making that my last question. Thank you very much indeed, Professor and Judge Helen Keller. It was a really good conversation. It was my pleasure to talk to you. The Science for Policy podcast is produced by SAPEA. We're a consortium of Europe's academies and learning societies, and we're part of the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism. We provide evidence and expertise to inform the work of the group of chief scientific advisors. SAPEA is funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 programme for research and innovation, and you can find lots more information about us and our work at sapea.info. Finally, the rather lovely cello music that's playing right now is performed by Elizaveta Sushchenko. So I shall shut up and let you enjoy the last few bars. Bye for now.